Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Yesterday was an amazing day at prayer chair. We, we go out every week and, uh, and we just really minister to people on the streets. And yesterday we, we had quite a few people. We even had people come down from London to, to join the team. And then we had people from uh, yeah, different churches. It was just quite remarkable. So, but yesterday was, a, I just felt a really a special day. God was just pouring out his grace. And yesterday, I know in New Road where we were praying, because we had a team also in East Street, there's just lots of tears flowing. It just, it was really just touching my heart as, as Jesus was just touching people. We had one fellow, he was kneeling on the ground and he was just weeping. He was just weeping in tears because he just really sensed the presence of God just really touched him and touched his heart. And then we had another lady, she was just standing and a couple of the girls were just praying for her and she was just in tears, was just pouring down her face as Jesus was just really touching her heart and just ministering her. And then there was another person who was in the same place once again when Jesus was just touching it, the Holy Spirit just touched these people and, and their heart was just open, totally open and it was just so profound. And to me, the greatest gift is when I minister to people and you actually see the change and the transformation. You see Jesus touch them, you know, lifting burdens, promising eternal life, lifting the load off them. And they all of a sudden see there is a hope and there is a purpose and there is a plan in their life that God has for them. It was just an exceptionally wonderful day. So uh, if you'd like to come down and join us at some point. You know, I'm always praying for the workers. The harvest is ready, but the workers are few. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. This hot and sticky Sunday, so we get used to some warm weather. I've been running through Acts and seeing, really, that, I mean, Paul must be one of the greatest evangelists and church planters in the whole history of Christianity. What Paul was able to do in the ancient world was just astonishing. No more so than as he arrives um, in uh, Greece, in Macedonia, it's called, and moves from Philippi to Thessalonica, which is where we're going to look at the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy and the team course in the Roman Empire. One of the remarkable asides about this, the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, was that you could travel in the Roman Empire in relative safety. If you're a Roman citizen and anything was done to you, you would face the full wrath of Rome. Commentators often think that Jesus came at just the right time. A time when the gospel could be um, across the world, it could be moved across the world, and the, uh, the ability to write down and, and scribes to copy down the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the letters of Jesus, all of these things. So you could do this walk, it would have taken Paul three days to go from Philippi, you know, um, across really just walking parallel with the Aegean to Thessalonica. Today it would take you an hour and 58 minutes on a car, because I had a look. In those days, three days, it's about 100 miles, that's all. So he's moved from Philippi and he's coming down to, through two places, Apollonia and another word I can't pronounce. <clears throat> Amphipolis or something and it says then in, uh, from verse 1 and verse 2 that they came to Thessalonica there's a Jewish synagogue and as was his custom Paul went to the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from scriptures explaining and providing proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead and he said this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah and some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did quite a lot of God-fearing Greeks, quite a few other prominent women. So Paul goes, I suppose, where it's easy. He's trained under Gam Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of the day. Paul was a brilliant scholar. 
Sometimes I think, you know, why does God choose people? Paul was chosen and wrote most of the New Testament letters. And what I love about Paul, he's an extraordinary charismatic. Well, I like charismatics. I like people that will pray for the sick and cast out demons and endeavor to work miracles. Very often they're, they're quite of, you know, oh, very theatrical people. I think partly because to be able to do these things, you have to lose something of your dignity. You, you have to be willing to be a fool for Christ. You have to be willing to step out and do things that, um, you know, other people, more controlled people maybe don't want to do. But you have to hear the voice of the Lord, you have to risk, you have to do it. I don't know, but Paul was certainly one of those. Everywhere he went, but at the same time, he was a brilliant scholar. He was an extraordinary scholar. Probably my Bible teacher, my Bible, uh, when I was at uh, the LST, it was called London Bible College then, but the, I, I remember my New Testament lecturer said he was probably a genius. I mean, he was just extraordinary in his ability to um, communicate and to write down and to theologize why Jesus has come and what he achieved on the cross. And really, with that church, we need to do both. We'll look at when he speaks to the Bereans in a minute, but we need to do both. We need to be extraordinarily filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to know the Holy Spirit as a person. We, we need to be able to be a church that can heal the sick. You say, why? Because Jesus healed the sick. If we represent Jesus, we must be able to heal the sick. Does that mean every sick person gets healed? No. But as John Wimber, my kind of mentor to start this when I was 19, he said, if you pray for no one, no one will get healed. He said, pray for 100 people. Some of them will get healed. Someone somewhere will get healed if you keep praying. And you'll get better because you'll be more practiced, because you'll persevere. So Paul, this is the Apostle Paul. This is the, the person that is coming into a Jewish synagogue. And here he needs his ability to understand Jewish scriptures, I think. Sometimes people ask you questions and you're just going to need to know the Bible. You've just got to know it. You've got to know what the Bible says about it. It's not enough to have a wild guess. Can I pray for you? That'll work many times. But sometimes people are asking questions, they're thinking about things. So I, I wish that we had here, you know, a sort of a, um, a footnote, what Paul said. What did he say? Where did he reference these scriptures? And I'm guessing, you know, Paul did a number of things when he's in this Jewish synagogue and he's reasoning to them from scripture. You may be going back to Isaiah 53. Let me read to you what Isaiah 53 says. 500 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah said this about the Lord. He said, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. Talking about Jesus. There's a lot more that Isaiah 53 says. But it really prophesies his death and resurrection. There are other indicators in the Old Testament what the Messiah would look like, a man of suffering. It's extraordinary. Um, Isaiah and the ability to prophesy. That's what Paul's doing. He's reasoning with people. He's going into a synagogue where he can use his name, he can, he can use the fact of his history, and he's gone to the right school. None of which bothers him anymore, but he's able to use something of his status, I think, and go into the synagogue and reason with them and talk about Jesus rising from the dead and proclaiming that he's the Messiah. In other words, that Jesus is the Lord and King. And many of those people then um, were persuaded. What I, what I think he does is 
is what he doesn't do elsewhere, but here he does do it. In the main, Paul is, is in weakness, fear, and trembling, working signs and wonders and healing the sick. He's speaking to people who have no knowledge of the Old Testament. But here he's trying to persuade people. I'm guessing if I was Paul, what would I say? i say, you've heard of this man Christ who was crucified. I've seen him alive. I've seen him. I've talked to his disciples. They've seen him alive. Go to Jerusalem. There are hundreds of people who have seen him alive. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was prophesied. He's risen from the dead and he was actually the sacrifice for our sins. And when you're speaking to Jews, they understood sacrifice. They understood the temple. They understood bringing animals, this bloody, you know, you, whether you brought a bird, whether you brought a lamb, but you would kill it yourself. There'd be blood everywhere. You'd hand it to the priest, the dead animal. They understood sacrifice. Paul would have said, here's the ultimate sacrifice. Everyone thought he was cursed. Everyone mocked him on the cross. Everyone thought this is, that, that this man is cursed by God. But he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And some people believed. Praise the Lord. And within a few weeks, because that's all that Paul was there, this is probably the most remarkable thing, started another church. It's, 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 an amazing, it's an amazing thing that Paul was able to do in the ancient world, was to start these churches. And I think the power of these churches, of course, was, was the teaching, the people, and we'll see one of them, but the, just the presence of God in the church. He was able to leave the church and it would grow. I don't know, I, I, I sometimes wish we could get denominationalism and, and just, you know, get rid of it. Get rid of the institutional nature of Christianity. It's there because as the church grows, you need structure, but once the presence of God is sort of you, you, we, is leaving, we've got the structure and the architecture of the church, but we haven't got the presence anymore. But Paul started these things. These were communities of people. These were living communities of people. This was not an organization. This was an organism. It was God's church, God's people. In a very difficult world, the Roman Empire. And it grew. Like I said, within 300 years, when Constantine accepted Christianity, he was merely ticking a box. Most of the Roman Empire had become Christians. It's a wonderful thing. So Paul's starting it here. <clears throat> um, the other takeaway, which is a, a common takeaway for me, and we're going to have to learn this, but the gospel upsets people. It just does. When you, you preach Jesus, <laughs> you would think everybody would want their sins forgiven, but they don't. I'm sure that's not my sermon, is it, Anne? But uh, no, I'm teasing. No. Um, you'd think everyone would want it, wouldn't you? Everybody will want this message that Paul's preaching. You know, I've done prayer chair with Michael and the others many times and on the seafront, which is my favorite place. And, and some people just look at you with a look of hatred. We're just sitting there offering people, would you like some prayer? Would you like a blessing? Can we pray? They look at you with daggers of hatred. I think they, they obviously see the word Christian over you. You know, and that, you know, I look at them and I think they'd throw us to the lions if they could. Why is that? I, I think the, there's just an enmity in the hearts of some men and some women towards the message of Jesus Christ, towards the message that Jesus is God towards the message this is salvation. It stirs up enmity in people. Now, in the Western church, we, love, we hate that. We want a united country. But the truth is, Christianity disunites people. 
And you have to choose. Am I going to choose Jesus or reject Jesus? There's no sitting on the fence. Am I for Jesus? Am I against Jesus? And there's a choice to be made. And some people, they, their choice is, no, I don't want him. I've heard about him. He's going to change my life. I don't want him in my life. And others run and say, yes, I want him. Fall at his feet, crying, saying, yes, Lord, save me. And so Paul's speaking this about the Messiah and Paul and Silas, a number of God-fearing Greeks, quite a few prominent women. So again, another motley church. This is just a church starting. Motley crew again. But these people believe. These people are being transformed from darkness to light. Now here's the enmity that comes, you see. Other people, the other Jews, were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob. They started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouts out, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are defying Caesar's decrees, <coughs> saying there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They put Jason and the others on bail and then let them go. There's just enmity. I think whenever God moves, the, 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 the opposition to what God is doing, many times it, it just comes from the church. You'd think the church would accept a move of God. That isn't true either. Many people in the church just hate it. Many times when God begins to move, he, he moves outside of the existing architecture of the church. The bishops, the archbishops, and just chooses some, someone else. But this someone else can heal the sick. This someone else, when they invite the Spirit to come, he comes. This someone else can cast out demons. Spiritual authority not just ecclesiastical authority. So it makes people jealous, just like it made the Jews jealous here. It creates enmity. Not with everyone, not all the time, not everywhere. But one of the ways that you know that God is moving, one of the ways you know that God is moving in the church, is that more and more people decide they don't like it. <laughs> and it's like, well, how do you handle that? How do you handle people not liking you just because you're a Christian? Just because you believe and acknowledge that I'm a follower of Jesus. And one way or the other, we, we have to, get to come to terms with that because that is what is happening and that is what will happen. And what I love here more than anything is that they know, they know how to attack and they say, um, they're saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Now think about that. Because that is true then. The enemy of, the, the, these enemies of Christianity understood what was being preached. They're saying Jesus is king. And we haven't had kings. I know we've, we have a very benevolent queen for the last 70 years. But she doesn't have any authority anymore. Remember Henry VIII as king. Just to look at him the wrong way would kill you. Kings have authority. Lords have authority. Jesus is Lord. Sometimes people are foolish. They say, oh, don't worry, I'll live, with, you know, I'll, me and Jesus, I'll talk to him when I get up there. It's like he's Lord and King. You won't be talking to him at all. He's judge of all the earth. You're either going to be with him or against him. But it's going to be too late. He's Lord. I don't know the words, how to phrase or to understand, you know, that, that Jesus is King and Lord. You see, when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus said, I am. But my, my kingdom is of another world. Everyone on the side of truth, he said to Pilate, everyone on the side of truth listens to my words. Pilate said, what is truth? Because there's the king 
looking weak. There's the king of the universe. Remember, this Jesus that Pilate is looking at doesn't look like a king. There's nothing about him, his majesty or his beauty that would attract you to Jesus. He's an ordinary looking human being, but he's also fully God and Pilate doesn't recognize that. And he is king. He is king of the universe. He's king of the seas and the whales and the fishes. He's king of England. He's king of Colombia. He's king of Spain and Germany. He's king of the world. He's king of everything. And he became king of kings and lord of lords, vindicated by his father in heaven when he rose from the dead. And what Paul is proclaiming is this man, this Jesus, is risen from the dead. He's been vindicated by God. He seats now at the right hand of God and he is king of kings and lord of lords. I just, I'm in awe of that. People believe that. But just think about that in your own heart. He is your king and lord. Your king, your father in heaven is king of kings and lord of lords. And when Jesus comes back, he isn't going to come back in the same way that he faced Pilate. That day is done. He is going to come back as you would expect a king to come back with holy angels in attendance. And he's coming back to rule. He's coming back as king. Every single knee will bow then. The dead will rise. Everyone, the books will be opened. Probably the most frightening verse in the whole book of the New Testament is in Revelation. It says something like, everyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Imagine that. Everyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The King of Kings is coming back. And they understood, the early Christians, that he is king. This Jesus that stood before Pilate, this Jesus that the Apostle John ate with and, and wrote about, is king. This is how it went down in the beginning of Revelation when John met him. Remember, John had spent, the Apostle John spent four years, and Revelation is really, it's just a prophecy. But John fell into a trance in Revelation. And I'll paraphrase the words a little bit of how John and what John sees. Um, it says, I, John, this is Revelation 1 verse 9, um, was on the island of Patmos because of the testimony of Jesus. And he says, on the Lord's day, it's probably a Sunday, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now in the spirit means, I think he's in a trance. He doesn't know where he is. His physical senses are suspended, but the spirit man, the spirit person inside of him is very much alive and he's seeing this prophecy. And he says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest the hair on his head was white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. You can read that later. See, I think, I'm paraphrasing, I think the Son of Man here turned to John and said, John, it's me. It's me. It's Jesus. See, John had spent three years with the earthly Jesus, fully man, fully God, in, in weakness. But now Jesus is at the right hand of God. Now you see him in all his glory. And John was seeing Jesus in all his glory. And, and he, he, all his energy, he just collapsed. And I think John, I, I think Jesus said, it's me, John. 
It's the one that you've hung out with for four years. I'm, I'm your God. You see, this is the God that's coming back. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's done. When Jesus was on the cross, he said it's finished. Three hours in the afternoon on the cross, he breathed his last, he breathed his last, he gave up his life. When he was ready to give up his life, when he'd paid for the sin of the world, when he'd forgiven the man on the cross, when he'd, he'd, he'd asked his father to forgive those who were crucifying, when it was all done, he breathed his last and said, it's over, it's finished, it's done. He's paid. And our choice is to accept the payment, to live the life, to walk it, until we meet him in the kingdom of God one day, forever and ever. But it's done. That's the message that Paul comes with. That's the message, that's the message really our culture needs to hear because our culture is completely and utterly lost. I mean, it's lost. Lost in celebrity culture, lost in not knowing whether they're males or females anymore, lost in the, you know, just the, the, the average greed of money or acquisitions. Lost. When King Jesus is king, and he beckons, come. If you're weary, you're burdened, come to me. So of course, Jason here, he's one of the early Christians. He's a Catholic saint now, I think. Whoever Jason is from Thessalonica. And um, so Paul's now established a church. He's been there a few weeks. He goes to, the, to Berea and uh, again in Greece. Paul and Silas, they went to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. I always find that a bit racist, really. It's like these people are better than here, you know. It's, but for some reason, these Jews in Berea are more open-minded than these Jews in Thessalonica. Paul always goes to the Jews first because he, he's got an immediate bridge. Now that doesn't always happen because after this he's going to Athens, they know nothing. But he, he wants to find, I, I think many of the countries that we're seeing revival in, for, in Colombia, Colombia is a Catholic country. They know something of God, something of Jesus, something of, of, of him being on the cross. They've just never met him. They've never experienced the life that comes through the Spirit. So the evangelists come, they work signs and wonders and miracles and healings. Say, this man on the cross is alive. You can meet him, and they meet him en masse, hundreds of thousands, millions. Well, Paul's only doing that with the Jews. He's doing exactly the same thing. And I guess as well, he's saying, look, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I, as to legalistic righteousness, I'm faultless. I've never done any of these things that the Gentiles do. Trained under Gamaliel, he says, it's all rubbish. It's all rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. It's a bit like Derek Prince, actually. You know, I've been to Eton, I'm educated. I've got a scholarship to be a, um, an, an intern professor at Cambridge. My life is assured, I'm a Greek scholar, I'm a, a scholar of um, Aristotle and Plato. He said, I, I give it all up and throw it away, it's rubbish, that I may be found in Christ Jesus. John Wimber was the, fa the, you know, the founder of the vineyard when, when I used to listen to him. He wrote songs with the Righteous Brothers that were worth millions. He was an extraordinary man, John Wimber, an extraordinary musician. He was led to Christ by a very kind of simple man, Gunnar Payne, but a man who was sold out for Jesus. And John said he knelt down in that man's living room one day and he gave his life to Jesus. And he threw everything else away. He saw it like a vision, a picture of someone he'd seen years before uh, walking with an A-board. I mean, you've got to be, you know, as a Christ, this Christian, and he met him later, he walked with an A-board up and down the streets of somewhere in California. You know, I'm a fool for Christ. Then on the reverse was, who's full of you? I'm a fool for Christ, who's full of you? And John saw that in a vision. He said, oh, that, that's what you've called me to be, Lord. I'm to be your fool. 
Okay. And he went with his wife. He, I mean, he went with his wife with this huge record collection. Many of them first editions signed. And he, he took it all to the dumpster and he threw it all away. It was at the time when the Beatles were doing their first tour in America and they wanted him to do it. They wanted him to organize the tour when he had no money because he'd given up everything. He signed away the royalties to all the... He said no. But he looked at his wife. They needed the money. You see, I understand why God would use him so much and why God would use Paul. Paul was, and Derek Prince, because they weren't interested. Paul wasn't interested. This is where I've been educated by Gamaliel. I said, I consider that rubbish. Same as Derek Prince, I've been to eat rubbish. The only thing that these guys thought about was, I belong to Jesus Christ now. I belong to him. I have redemption through his blood. Everything else was meaningless. That's Paul. That's, that's his life. He gave up everything. And so must you and me. If we're to find ultimate life. And so in Thessalonica, you know, the, he's moved over to Berea. These people are, are asking. And what I like about it is as a result, many of them believed. Many Greek men in Berea, many men. And... Um, and it says, with great eagerness, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Verse 11, we'll nearly close there. They examined the scriptures every day. In other words, Paul's saying, Paul's preaching to them things from the scriptures, and they want to know if it's true. I'll be honest with you, when I meet people with a dog collar today, it's meaningless to me. I mean, whether they're preaching the truth or not, I have no idea. But just because they're wearing a dog collar doesn't mean in any way, shape or form that they're preaching truth. They can be so off beam, so hundreds of miles away from the truth. But the Bereans want to know. And the takeaway for you in the congregation today is don't just take my word for it. Look it up. Is what I'm saying true? Is Jesus king? Is he Lord? Is he God of the universe? Is he going to judge you one day? As sure as eggs is eggs, you're going to stand before him. I'm 57 now, and some of you are my age, and life goes quick, doesn't it, Rick? Life just goes quick, you know. I know you're not as old as me. I shouldn't have picked on you. I should pick on someone else. But life is over before you know it. I mean, it really, it, it's over quick. One day we're going to meet him. Check it out, people. Check out the Bible. Read the Bible. Listen to, listen to people. Is, is it true? Is what I'm saying true? This is the fifth city that Paul's come to. And uh, the fifth city where he's facing all kinds of of opposition but it's the fifth city where another church is planted it's a wonderful thing Christianity it's a wonderful thing that God is doing so yes there's opposition to Christianity there will always be opposition to Christianity that will come Jesus is king just when you're out in your day to day life wondering what I'm going to do or where I'm going to go or am I studying hard enough or what does life mean remember who the king of kings is look up at the sky he's king of all this my God is king if you've given your life to him you're his son or daughter he's your king but he is the king that's why every knee will bow Adolf Hitler may not want to bow before King Jesus but he will bow as will Stalin, as will Genghis Khan, as will everyone. They may not want to, but they will bow on their knees before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he's king. And that kingdom will be enforced. And you will do as the king says now. That day is coming. And it will be a terrible day of judgment for many. 
my admonition as a preacher to get on the right side of history and to choose Jesus will never let you go and his love is vast as the ocean Amen? Amen shall we stand and let's pray Thank you.